Hi there, I'm Blair Cook, and in this lesson, we're gonna look at a case study. It's a case study right in my very own hometown, and it's a case study of executive expense scandal. For the past six weeks, Jen and I have been observing a very public uh, expense scandal unfolding before our very eyes, and it makes for an incredible story uh, around ethics. What makes this case study particularly interesting is how it has snowballed in a few short weeks into a full-blown scandal. Now, I'm going to let you decide for yourself whether or not this is a case of fraud or just poor judgment by the individuals and those with oversight responsibilities. Jen and I know personally a number of the people involved in this particular case study. And so we're really gonna to try to stick as much as possible to case facts. However, if we do express any opinions, they are just that, opinions. And the case study that we're gonna talk about today has to do with the IWK Healthcare Center. The IWK Healthcare Center provides regional care for the three maritime provinces in Eastern Canada, where Jen and I happen to live, to women and children. Given that Jen and I both live literally across the street from this world-class facility and is where all of our seven daughters have been born, Jen and I have a particular interest in this case. By the numbers, you can see that the IWK delivers literally thousands of babies each year, tens of thousands of emergency visits, and delivers on hundreds of thousands of clinical visits. This is a large, well-known, critical piece of the healthcare infrastructure in our region. The organization has been recognized by external parties as being one of the top 25 employers in all of Atlantic Canada. The IWK brand is one of the most well-recognized and well-respected brands by the citizens of our region. This brand recognition is instrumental, instrumental in raising funds each year to keep expanding the capabilities of the healthcare center. The IWK Foundation, which is the charitable uh, arm of the IWK Health Center, raised over $50 million last year alone from the community. With that background in mind, let me tell you the story of what's been going on the last six weeks. On July 13th, 2014, nearly three years ago, a new CEO of the IWK Health Center was appointed. And the IWK Health Center is the arm of the IWK responsible for the operations uh, of the hospital. Tracy Kitch was appointed with very high expectations and she was recruited from Toronto's world-renowned Mount Sinai Hospital. Her nursing and healthcare background made her an ideal candidate to lead this region's flagship healthcare institution. Now, because we are all financial people listening to today's case study, you should all know that the healthcare center had an operating budget of approximately $300 million, which was mostly funded, as you can see, by the government, which makes the IWK a public sector enterprise. However, the IWK is governed by an independent and volunteer board of directors. Director appointments are approved by the provincial government. And in a recent call for nominations, just last fall, note the skill sets that they seek. Quality and corporate performance, governance, technology and innovation, enterprise risk management, and community and stakeholder relationships. In hindsight, the board had no idea how important these skills would be a year later when the proverbial shit hit the fan. The current board of directors, as of today, look something like this. And again, we're right in the midst of this scandal. It's a very diverse group and mix of people. The chair and the past chair both work for the electric utility. We have a mix of people from both the private sector and the public sector and the healthcare sector. We have three people who have executive positions inside the IWK itself. Also notice that there's a number of directors who are professional directors with the ICD designation. As a professional director myself, I'd say that on paper, the board had the talent and the skills necessary to fulfill fiduciary responsibility. Now, while the board has a mandated 19 directors, it has operated in recent years with only 17 directors, uh, with two vacancies that no government appears worried about fulfilling with any degree of urgency. 
Now, from the date of hiring of Tracy Kitchen 2014 through 2015 and 2016, she enjoyed a sterling reputation. In fact, in 2016, Ms. Kitch was named the Women Network's Canada's Most Powerful Women Top 100 Award winner. Now, interestingly, today, when you click on that press release at the IWK, nothing comes up. But never you mind, we can check out this prestigious award by going to the WXN website itself. And in the public sector category, Ms. Kitch's contributions as a transformational leader were well recognized. Her ability to set vision and effectively lead and align the people working under her generated high praise indeed. So let's see what this performance looked like in 2017. Included in the 2017 annual report, which is publicly available, you can hear Ms. Kitch and Bob Hamp, the board chair at the time, talking about some of the key things of importance to the leadership at the IWK Health Center. I've highlighted a few of the key themes in this clip, so let's have a listen now. The credibility and the influence that the IWK has in Nova Scotia and across the Maritimes is very deeply felt. People know automatically that you're talking about a world-class uh, facility uh, with world-class intentions. So we're very mindful of the trust that the community puts in us and the stewardship role of serving the needs of community. We have the potential to be better than we ever thought we could be. And we have that potential because of our staff. I think we're in a position of abundance here, not scarcity. So um, abundance of talent, abundance of people who care, um, that's, that's a huge asset. So needless to say, the IWK is a highly respected institution. And the board and the CEO, just based on that uh, video clip, seem well aligned on the challenges ahead. But let's see how well Ms. Kitch actually performed in meeting her own strategic vision. The strategic plan and the evaluation against plan is made publicly available given that this is a publicly accountable enterprise. There have indeed been areas of noted improvement. Targets were met in terms of training and length of stay of patients' visits. Improvements were noted, but targets were not met in the areas of access, patient satisfaction, and safety. However, when it came to delivering surgeries within the clinically accepted range, performance actually worsened. So I actually like this scorecard. It kind of articulates the vision and, and puts it into measurable targets for us to understand as, as taxpayers and, and stakeholders of this, this facility. However, I was kind of walking away looking at this, this scorecard, and I correct me if I'm wrong, but expecting better results from a top 100 award winner such as Miss Kitch. So I'm not exactly sure, and I'm not going to surmise or suggest otherwise, whether Miss Kitch's job performance as CEO factored into the story that I'm about to tell you. Also new in 2017 was a provincial government mandate to have publicly accountable enterprises such as the IWK improve transparency in how the CEOs are spending their discretionary funds in the areas of hospitality and travel expenses. So in addition to the $290,000 that Ms. Kitch earned in 2017, the IWK was required by this administrative directive to report the CEO travel and hospitality expenses on the IWK's website, making them publicly available for us to take a look at. Here is what you can actually see what's on the IWK's website. Ms. Kitch's expenses were fully disclosed. In the current version of that expense report, she reported CEO expenses of about $31,000. And that simple four-page report, which interestingly is signed by both the CEO, Tracy Kitch, and Bob Hamp, the board chair. Then along came this reporter. As one may expect, reporters kind of love those Freedom of Information Acts that allow them to get access to internal documents. What tipped off this particular reporter, Michael Gorman, was that the amount of travel and hospitality expenses reported by Ms. Kitch kept changing. Something was amiss. This led to an investigative report in which Mr. Gorman, who works for the CBC, published in June of 2017 the following uh, news article. Because upon reviewing the credit card statements which he had solicited under the Freedom of Information Act, he noticed that there were way more charges going through the corporate credit card 
than were reported in her public disclosures. Furthermore, he began noticing charges for things that would not typically be incurred by a CEO for business purposes. Things like $3,219 to the Bay, a retail department store, or charges to iTunes and Netflix. Something was definitely fishy. So upon follow-up with the CFO, Stephen Darcy, he reiterated that the bulk of the expenses were indeed in the normal course of business or were errors that were subsequently refunded to the hospital. For instance, for the Bay and the iTunes charges. In fact, Darcy admitted that there were a number of personal charges on the credit card and that the hospital had already been reimbursed for those charges. So after publishing this article in June, all went quiet for a couple of months. That is until August 23rd. On August 23rd, the new board chair who had just come in in June, uh, an individual by the name of Karen Hutt, who just happens to be a work colleague of the former board chair, Bob Hamp, issued this press release indicating that Miss Kitch had resigned to pursue other opportunities. A simple and clear message that arises from time to time, but begs the question about whether that was a true story or not. Whose decision was it that Miss Kitch leave? Hers or the board's? The local nightly news picked up the press release, but astutely followed up with the board chair, Karen Hutt, to determine whether there was any connection between the June investigative report done by the CBC and Miss Kitch's departure. At that point, Miss Hutt had indicated that Miss Kitch had made a partial repayment of the personal expenses incurred on the corporate credit card, but more interestingly, that an independent review was underway. Nearly a week later, the IWK board released the results of the independent review. And the review found weaknesses and made recommendations that the board immediately adopted, as one would expect. But what was in that report? Now, Grant Thornton was the firm that was commissioned to review the CEO expenses and to examine conformance to the hospital policies, as well as the efficacy of those policies themselves. The cost of this independent review has yet to be publicly released. There were three overall findings coming out of this independent review by Grant Thornton. Firstly, Grant Thornton quantified the amount of the potential personal expenses as $47,273. Ms. Kitch had already reimbursed the IWK for $25,000, leaving approximately $22,000 outstanding. Now, part of the challenge in this review is that Ms. Kitch had not maintained the documentation of her expenses, you know, receipts and such. And in the absence of evidence to the contrary, any expenses without documentation were assumed by Grant Thornton to be personal. The second finding from Grant Thornton compounded the challenges of the reporting and the accounting for Ms. Kitch's expenses. And these arose because she didn't submit expenses on a timely basis. And this meant there was kind of a, a ticking time bomb for years that no one ever thought could blow up the way that it has. Now, the third issue raised by Grant Thornton was to be somewhat critical of the review process used by the board chair of Ms. Kitch's expenses. The board chair, Bob Hamp, was not provided any backup for her expenses, nor did he request it. So her expenses were processed as submitted. When all was said and done, the personal usage of the corporate credit card broke down as follows, as you can see on the screen. Over half of the amount related to personal travel as Ms. Kitch maintained her residence in Toronto and used her corporate flight passes to travel back and forth. What was important to note though, and I think really interesting, is that Ms. Kitch did not attempt to hide these expenses at all. In fact, even before Grant Thornton got involved, she had proactively been identifying the personal expenses incurred on the corporate credit card for the past two years. However, the lack of timeliness and supporting documentation of the legitimate expenses from the personal expenses made it doubly difficult to sort out the differences. With the Grant Thornton report now public, Michael Gorman, the reporter at the CBC, had a whole new waft of evidence to report. He reported about the personal travel back and forth to Halifax and Toronto, and he called out the inconsistencies in the findings and the responses he had received two months earlier from management. Ms. Hutt, the board chair, was now clearly distancing herself from management when she is quoted as saying, what is clearly troubling is that even with the guidance of policies around how things should be happening, it didn't appear as though they were. Hutt fell into line behind the independent findings of Grant Thornton. She was later quoted in the article as saying, 
We trust that the CEO and management will carry out those policies. Certainly not blind trust, but we trust that those things are going to happen in the way they're intended to. However, Hutt stopped short of alleging any criminal activity at this point and indicated that the police were not involved. The expectation was that Kitsch would repay the balance of the personal expenses owed and that would presumably be the end of it. If only. Eleven days later, the taint begins to spread further as the IWK's CFO, Stephen Darcy, who was also recruited from Toronto about the same time as Tracy Kitsch, was asked to step aside and put on administrative leave. The heat of the scandal was now in full force and the board was beginning to drown in challenges to their own credibility. In an attempt to quell the public outcry, the board reached out to the Provincial Auditor General, the idea being presumably to get yet another independent party involved to assess what went on and what should be done going forward. The scandal widens further still as three days later, politicians start taking pot shots at each other. Our own provincial premier, Stephen McNeil, and the Minister of Health, Randy DeLore, both take public stands behind the board of directors and the actions they have been taking. McNeil chimes in his own thoughts on Kitch's behavior, calling it inappropriate, but not criminally wrong. However, the opposition parties, as one might expect, take the opportunity to criticize the government and the Minister of Health and what they are doing to identify who is responsible. As one member of the opposition puts it, Oh dear Lord, of course somebody should be held accountable. This is taxpayer money. Keep in mind though, we're only talking about $11,000 outstanding at this point. So the next day, Michael Gorman picks up on that line of thinking and decides to probe the Borb's role in this scandal. He finds an expert on board governance who believes that the lack of board education is to blame. This expert also cites the minimal standards for directors. The requirement, and I quote, the requirement to be a director on board is shockingly minimal. It's over 18, not bankrupt, and not insane. Okay, now I'm pretty sure I did a little more research on the current slate of directors than the so-called expert because as you may have heard earlier, you have a very diverse very high qualified, very highly educated, with several experts in governance on the board of the IWK itself. But the expert then goes on to cite that larger boards, those with 15 or more members, don't often ask the hard questions. Now the IWK board with 17 members at the time, or 19 members if it's fully nominated, is too large to ask the right questions of management and demand the right information about the CEO for all board members and not just a select few. Now, the expert here, Mr. LeBlanc, may have some valid uh, observations here. But I walked away from reading this article feeling like perhaps Mr. Gorman was stoking the scandal fire a little bit too much. You can be your own judge on that, but we aren't done yet. Three days later, Mr. Gorman's at it again because he finds another smoking gun. I think he's still a little bit miffed by the lies that he was told back in June by management. And he uses the Freedom of Information Act to gain access to all the emails inside of the IWK Health Center. And in these emails, the truth comes out. It shows that CFO Stephen Darcy was involved in Kitch's expenses as early as October 2016. There were emails where Darcy is trying to get more information on Kitch's expenses through Kitch's executive assistant. To quote one of Darcy's emails, although this doesn't appeal to my inherently laser nature, unquote, doesn't exactly help his case in building credibility that, it, that he was kind of really on top of getting Kitch to deal with her expense issue. In the emails, it shows that Darcy's own staff were pressing for more timely, more documented expenses from Kitch, and replies from Kitch's assistant continued to stall on this front. Darcy was shown to have written Kitchen email outlining his concerns that her expenses were literally disproportional to her counterpart at the Nova Scotia Health Authority. Gorman dug the knife into Darcy very deep when he called Darcy in a flat out lie when he responded earlier about the amount charged to Kitch for the flight expenses, simply stating that it wasn't true. Darcy has been copied on the changing expense amounts the entire way through. Board chair at the time, Bob Hanf, was oblivious to everything that was going on inside management and around this issue of Kitch's expenses. It wasn't until Gorman's investigative report in June that the board had any inkling or knowledge 
of the impropriety. Hamp was quoted in the article as saying, I trust the information that's being provided to me had been properly reviewed internally and therefore was accurate. In hindsight, I would say that more information in the reports would have provided better controls. Meanwhile, the public outrage at this expense scandal is actually beginning to really tarnish uh, the IWK and all the good work it actually does. Over at the IWK Foundation, which is an entirely separate organization from the IWK Health Center, they too are starting to feel the public pressure and find themselves having to write public letters reassuring the public that the foundation is not the IWK and that the foundation has its own board of directors that aren't the same as those at the health care center. The letter goes further to distance the foundation from the health center by explaining that the donations raised by the foundation do not fund the health care center, but instead go to the health care capital projects. On September 28th, the board is still under fire from all directions, and Ms. Hutt issues another press release, summarizing the actions that the board has taken the past month. To up the ante even further, the Halifax Regional Police have now been called in. A criminal investigation is now presumably underway. Nary a day later, however, the scandal continues to escalate, as the board is now feeling the heat and now needs to push back. Further investigations into spending authorized by Kitch uncover another violation of unauthorized spending. This time, it's for our contract PR consultant. Ms. Kitch had let go the former uh, communication boss, who had an annual salary of $124,000, filling it instead with Tracy Chisholm's services. Now, Tracy is someone who's from Toronto, has worked closely with Kitch in the past. This was originally intended to be a transitional service until a new communication person could be hired. Only that never happened. The role was never filled and Chisholm managed to convert an approved $35,000 project into an unapproved $152,000 role over the past couple of years. Disclosures are made in the press releases around some of the trivial work that Chisholm was performing in her role as a contractor. One possible rationale for disclosing this type of information is to further deflect attention away from the board, who's under a considerable amount of heat a few weeks ago, and back to Ms. Kitch, who had started the whole fiasco in the first place. Now, a weekend comes and go, and for whatever reason, Ms. Kitch fails to repay the remaining $11,000 by the end of September deadline. This provided the board with yet another opportunity to divert attention back to Ms. Kitch as they threaten legal action to collect the remaining funds. However, two days later, it's announced that the IWK has finally received the remaining reimbursement amounts from Ms. Kitch. And a spokesman from the IWK, not Ms. Hutt this time, announces that it's all over and it's time for us to refocus on the business at hand. Have we heard the last of this scandal? I highly doubt it. But let's tally up the scorecard of what we've learned. First of all, Miss Kitch's reputation is now in tatters, particularly in our local city. Criminal investigations are underway and likely to go on for months or perhaps even years. CFO Stephen Darcy, his reputation too is in uh, tatters simply by his association with Miss Kitch and some of the damning emails that have subsequently surfaced. The board of directors have certainly lost a, a lot of credibility with the general public um, and including each of those and all of those directors that serve as volunteers on that board of directors. Uh, sadly, the IWK Health Center and the IWK Foundation, uh, the charitable foundation, their reputation too is badly bruised as a result of the scandal that's been going on for the past six weeks. And the scandal has even extended all the way to the provincial government. Both the premier and the health minister are suffering a few body blows along the way to do with this IWK expense scandal. But again, before we move on and conclude, let's just take a look and let's talk about the financial costs associated with this scandal. A total of $47,000 was proven to be inappropriately charged to a corporate credit card. And as is so often the case, this is a tiny percentage of the resources deployed and spent by the IWK organization. In fact, in this situation, Ms. Kitch has fully acknowledged that she owed back the money to the IWK in the first place. However, her careless lack of timely disclosure and poor record keeping made matters only worse. 
she should never have used the corporate credit card in the first place for personal expenses. And I'm sure she's going to regret that decision for the rest of her life. Or at least a few years until the Auditor General and the Halifax Police Department conclude their investigations. So no one could possibly have predicted how this simple indiscretion and lapse of personal judgment could have such wide-reaching implications. So the moral of this story is to recognize that ethics is about doing what is right, even when no one is looking, or you can get away with it.